There are a large number of different types of lasers which have been developed for different applications. I described the EMBH laser last time, etched mesa buried heterostructure. And uh, you see this is a, a diagram of that same structure. Um, this is the mesa, okay, this is a P contact, and this is the indium gallimastinide phosphide active layer. It's a relatively simple structure. This is the active layer. And uh, this can have threshold currents of about 10 to 30 milliamps, output powers 20 to 200 milliwatts. And uh, these um, active bits are, um, could be something like 0.2 microns. And notice that this is stripe geometry, okay? So this is the active, this is the active region. Just to show you some of the other structures in greater detail than I showed earlier, uh, these are various uh, buried heterostructure lasers. For example, here, even if you can't read the writing, here this active this is proton implanted. Okay, so these areas are proton implanted, so you have current going uh, only in this direction. Uh, this is that double channel uh, structure, dub two channels, and this is the which is defining the channel. Um, here you have a grooved, <coughs> vertical grooving to defining to define the uh, active layer. And here you have a buried crescent. This is called a buried crescent laser, but look at this. The active layer is not planar, it's, it's curved, so it's a buried crescent laser. The other more complex structures that I talked about. This is a distributed feedback laser. You can notice that here's this P-type, N-type uh, active region and the grating. The grating is designed to uh, match the peak gain. Of course, it means complex crystal growth and the structure itself is, is uh, um, quite complex. And this is the distributed Bragg reflector laser. Okay, you can get a little tuning. Here, notice that the active section is here and the grating is somewhere else. Okay, this is the DBR section. This is the phase section. So by applying a voltage here, one can change slightly the velocity of the optical waves going and thereby change the phase and thereby tune the laser a little bit. Um, this business of uh, okay, let's see. the okay, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Okay, okay. This is interesting from the point of view of. Uh, consideration of the why DFBs are better. This is a fabri perot laser, okay, and this is a DFB laser. And what is important is that you look at the gain. Remember, I'd, I'd, there is a peak gain at a particular wavelength lambda zero. Here's the gain curve, okay, and here's the loss curve. Okay. So uh, the gain will be more than the loss over a particular region. And as a result, you will have uh, all these modes which have more gain than loss. The wavelength will be, uh, these are the various modes that can oscillate okay, in this fabri perot laser. In the DFP laser, distributed feedback laser, because of this uh, grating, periodic grating, okay, uh, the loss is no longer flat like that. The loss is lowest here and it is high here. Okay. And notice that there is a, a lambda by 4 shift. Okay. Uh, that is to um, eliminate uh, degeneracy between the waves going in this direction and that direction. But that, that is only a very, uh, you know, a, a detail. But the main difference is that look here, if you look at the gain and the loss, okay, the gain will be more than the loss just over here, okay, the intersection, and so you will have single frequency. 
So what this grating is doing, it is it's like a mode filter. It is selecting one particular mode because the loss spectrum is changed due to this uh, lambda by 4 structure. Is that clear? Okay. The idea is that in the fabri perot laser, the gain is uh, fairly broad. The loss is also quite flat. Okay. So if, if this, this intersects this, okay, then the gain will be more than in the loss than over a large wavelength. Okay, because this is this is flat. Okay, so if you this, this increases, this intersection will be, you know, for example, you can say that the intersection will be like that. So all these all these uh, modes have gained more than the wave, more than the loss. Okay, so they depending upon the exact phase matching condition. Okay, there's a gain condition and a phase matching condition. Okay, so if the gain is more than the loss, it can oscillate. Okay. And uh, depending upon uh, the exact phase matching temperature or uh, other variables, okay, uh, all, all of these can oscillate. And uh, even if one is selected, the maximum, it can switch. It can suppose the gain switch changes slightly, okay, then this you can get mode hopping, either this mode or that mode or that mode. These are different values of, of M, say. Whereas in the uh, distributed feedback, because of this grating, okay, the phase relation is achieved for only a, s a particular value of lambda. Okay, so the loss is minimum for a particular value of lambda, which I gave last time. Okay, uh, capital uh, uh, lambda was equal to uh, particular value um, m lambda by mu. Okay, so when this intersects this, it will intersect over a small region of wavelength. Okay, so that selects this particular wavelength. And as a result, this is, it is a very stable uh, laser. Okay, the other thing is the line width of this, finally, is also much less than this. Okay, Because only uh, over a very small value of lambda is the gain more than the loss. So a DFP laser also has sharper line width than a fabri perot laser. That is one, one big advantage. Okay, uh, last time I didn't, uh, this diagram was not all, all that good. This is that double channel, okay, double channel laser. Okay, the, here are the two channels. These, this is the active region. Here you have this lambda by 4 shifted first order grating, okay. And uh, okay, this is a big picture of this, of this tunable DBR laser, okay. distributed Bragg reflection. This is an active region. Okay, look, look, this is a double channel type of structure. Okay, the wave propagates. Uh, this is a phase control region where the phase is changed by applying an electric field, um, and uh, this is the distributed Bragg reflection region. Notice that this is not under the active region. Okay. The active region is here. This is separate. So phase control region, it will control the phase of reflected wave. Yeah, it controls the velocity of the wave in principle, and uh, so phase, slight modification, say you know, a few hundred angstroms, uh, tunability is achieved by this. But obviously, this is a fairly complex. Look at this total length, one millimeter. Okay, so it's, it's a pretty complex device to, um, and these are used only for very specific reasons for. Um, getting very low line width and tunability etc., for experiments. Okay. Uh, there is uh, one topic that I have not uh, talked about, but I, I think I should mention it here, that that is uh, um, facet reflectivity. This is used to choose a particular. Um, we, have, we have seen that when we look at the um, confinement factor, okay, gamma versus d, okay, uh, there is very little. To, you know, it, it goes something like this. This is say T e and 
Tm. Okay. These are the two modes, and there's very little difference between the gamma going from one to uh, uh, zero to one. But what is it that controls uh, the choice between Te and Tm? It turns out that uh, the facet reflectivity is quite different for the two cases. Um, you remember um, in uh, optics there's a phenomenon called Brewster's, there's a Brewster's angle, okay? Brewster's angle uh, means that one particular orientation, one particular polarization of, of the wave is reflected much more than the other. So in this case, in facet reflectivity, it's found that if you measure R in percent, uh, the TE modes have much higher reflectivity, typically starting from 30, say, to 35 percent. Okay. T mode reflectivities go something like this. For This is for mode number M. So, say, mode number 3, 5, Eight. Okay, the scale is, you know, this is the scale here is about forty-three percent. Okay. Whereas for the TM modes, the reflectivity is goes the opposite way. Eight, etc. So this is this is TM modes. So obviously, uh, since the mode loss you know uh, goes as a log, you know, one by R, okay. So higher the reflectivity, okay, lower the loss. So the this is facet. This is bare facet without any particular coating. So this itself is a method of, uh, you know, selection. TE waves therefore have lower loss than TM waves. Okay. Sir, in this graph along x-axis. X-axis is okay. D. That's a good point. This is D. Um, this is zero. Okay. Uh, this is point five microns. Okay. So particular active, this is active layer width, okay? So for particular active layer width, say 2, okay, this has a reflectivity of, say, 37, 38 percent, and this is only of the order of, uh, okay, here it's about uh, 25, okay? So uh, facets are also important in, uh, facet coatings are important. So facets are important in, uh, Uh, mode selection and notice that higher order modes are, are preferred that is not very desirable you want you want uh, fundamental modes but uh, so you have to have uh, some other methods of uh, preferring the fundamental modes the other is uh, important point i may not be able to come back to is degradation okay. uh, if you have a Fabry Perot cavity, remember the dimensions are very small, and you have the laser light coming out, undergoing multiple reflection and and coming out. So this could be uh, you know 100 milliwatts or something like that, and um, 100 milliwatts is, is quite a large amount of power for this small area. So you have uh, a facet degradation in the sense that the uh, there may be damage, okay, due to damage in the facet, okay. Uh, pinholes or, or heating, the, the adhesion may um, uh, be affected. So as a result, facet coatings are quite important for high power lasers, for high power lasers, facet coatings are not, you know, simple anti-reflection coatings. You have hard coatings. And uh, typically, um, one can use something like a mixture of, uh, say, titanium oxide. Uh, you know, you have two layers, multi-layer coating, okay? 
maybe titanium oxide and another layer of uh, something like Y2O3. Okay. Um, a lot of this is proprietary. One can use SiO2 also. Okay. Titanium oxide for hard, good adhesion and uh, a combination to give that you want desirable uh, reflectivity, you want good adhesion, okay, this, these must be transparent also, okay, completely transparent at the very low loss, because if there's any absorption, that will cause heating, okay, so this facet coating is a, is a subject in, on its own, and for high power lasers, this is uh, quite important. It determines, this is one of the degradation mechanisms in, in a laser. Uh, it is not only in the active layer that something may happen, dark line defects, but the, at high power, the facets may, uh, may uh, be affected, may degrade. Okay, uh, there are a lot of varieties of lasers, uh, so let me just talk about the vertical cavity uh, surface emitting lasers. These are very important for um, uh, applications in Uh, for um, communication purposes, uh, one can say for interconnects, one day for interconnects, um, for c communication. Uh, one of the big, big advantages is, is that these lasers are not, they can be integrated. Okay. The idea is that on one wafer, you can you can have these vertical cavity lasers, which are surface emitting lasers, okay, they, they emit light this way, and each of them can be connected to detectors or circuits outside, okay, and so they can be individually uh, pulsed, um, and uh, they are not uh, large, discrete components like edge emitting lasers, but they're, they can be formed on one uh, substrate. The diameters can be varied. The diameters can be varied from, you know, from a micron to uh, thousands of microns, okay. Here, notice that these dimensions are determined by photolithography. Okay, what is, what is, uh, what are the other points? There is no cleavage required. No cleavage required for uh, um, formation of the lasers. Uh, easy coupling to fiber. That's what I've shown here. They can be easily coupled to. You can have the dimensions, say, 10 micron, which will just couple to the center of an optical fiber. Okay. Uh, In fact, um, these are like surface emitting LEDs. Remember, I talked about surface emitting LEDs. So the geometry is somewhat similar to surface emitting LEDs. And if I draw one of these structures, it could be something like this. Um, these are very short cavity devices. Cavity lengths are of the orders of, uh, you know, one to two microns, whereas in the edge emitting device, it was a few hundred microns. This has disadvantages as well as advantages, okay? So short cavity means a smaller gain, overall gain, because the path length is uh, less. So you can, the problem was that you have higher threshold current and uh, also higher, I will show why, uh, you have higher operating voltage, okay. 
so these are some of the disadvantages, but uh, they have been um, overcome. And here the cavity is defined by a Bragg reflection. Bragg reflectors. So, no cleavage, as I said, but by, by growth, defined by uh, multi layer And in this, it's somewhat similar to the uh, resonant cavity photodiodes, right? The basic principle is the same as resonant cavity photodiode. If I draw a picture of this. Uh, Okay, suppose it's something like this. This is exaggerated. layer is somewhere here and uh, there it is. Okay, this is make contact okay uh, some of the defining features are well you can have a quantum well structure here Then you have this is, is n plus. Okay, so this you have uh, lambda by four mirror stack, and you have another. Uh, Obviously, you know. uh, this is the P type side, okay. P plus. and uh, what is done is that here you have. Uh, region which is made high resistivity by proton implantation. Okay. So, so the light, uh, the, this is the active region where the light is generated and the light uh, is reflected from here, there. And this this is the cavity, which is only one or two microns, okay, uh, in dimension. Now, the one of the disadvantages is that uh, you know delta lambda is inversely proportional to L, the length of the cavity. Okay. So this is quite large. Uh, it can be something like a hundred nanometers. Um, 0.1 eV. What about this lambda by 4 mirror? Uh, typically for a gas, al gas device, suppose this is a gas uh, and it could be just aluminum arsenide, okay? Uh, because we are just using the optical properties. Uh, what is the N of gallium arsenide? That is about 3.5 and aluminum arsenide is 2.1. So lambda by four at this wavelength, uh, 
at the operating wavelength is uh, about 70 nanometers. Okay. And since this is lower, this will be of the order of 84 uh, nanometers. Okay. At lambda is equal to, talking about lambda is equal to, say, 980 nanometers. This is a, a typical uh, infrared wavelength where you can get. So uh, this lambda by 4 stack, it could have, uh, say, 20 layers of uh, uh, gas, al uh, gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide. You need a large number of layers to get high uh, reflection, and similarly 20 layers here. Okay. So this is a typical uh, VC cell structure. Um, yeah, you can tailor. So some light has to come out. Okay, so obviously this re reflectivity has to be slightly less than than here. Okay. What is the problem uh, with this uh, device? That the current flows. Okay, and you have to have a, a contact here. Okay, the current flows. So the current traverses these gratings. Okay, so. As a result, um, yeah. So this is this. These has to be have to be doped, okay, in order to lower the resistance. So, so when when they were first made, the problems were, as I mentioned, the pro one of the problems is that uh, you have um, short cavity length, okay. So that is one problem. But from the electrical point of view, that you had high resistivity, okay, due to mirrors. Top and the, car the carriers, electrons and holes were. Uh, notice here the current and the light are in the same direction, okay, whereas in the edge emitting laser, the current is in the vertical direction, light is coming out in the uh, horizontal direction. So, okay. So, uh, in the early days, people used uh, TiO2, SiO2, MgO type of mirrors. Okay. But nowadays, these are insulators. Okay. Nowadays, uh, what is used is doped, and you can use some amount of grading, uh, gas, cell gas, to to lower to lower the series resistance. Okay. Uh, so this high resistivity gives, gives you also higher, uh, the, you know, threshold voltage, okay. And uh, due to uh, lower gain, okay, uh, it gives, uh, okay, higher JTH also. But most of these problems have been overcome now using uh, doped and graded uh, layers, and uh, one can get these memories. They, they're also used in. Okay, these are sort of optical memories. You can get uh, nowadays about 256 elements, okay, 16 by 16 array. And they can work at uh, you know something like 500 megabits per second. So these uh, VC cells have become very important, and uh, I think I have some pictures of these. Let me see.
first lasers were made by a Japanese group. Uh, I thought I had a device here. Anyway, I think um, okay. Th this uh, journal has uh, some very recent journal. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Partly. Okay, it's colored. So, okay, this is a typical um, a VC cell structure. Okay, so this is the active region in the middle. This is a uh, Bragg reflection, Bragg reflection there, and the vertical cavity surface emission. Uh, you can have, you know, oxide confinement of this central region, iron implantation, or you can have a pillar. Okay, as 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 there. And uh, okay, these are probably if you can see this. If you, this is a proton impl implanted VC cell. Okay, uh, so this is proton implanted. This is proton implanted. So it narrows the region. This is N type. This is P type. N plus contact. N plus cal. So the current goes in this way, and the and the light also comes out in this way. Okay. And here, this is a MESA type, oxide uh, confined. So you have, uh, how is oxide? If you look at this, right in this, this is oxide, okay? Oxide stripe here, oxide stripe. So the current cannot flow this way. The current is confined and uh, it flows in that direction. So um, I won't uh, take up too much time talking about uh, VC cells, but these have uh, made uh, considerable impact. Um, and of course, uh, the other applications are that uh, they can be used in optical discs, okay, for holographic memories. And um, okay, uh, Uh, and they, I've just given you one wavelength, but they can operate at, you know, you can uh, choose the material. In this region, okay, you, you can use in-gas, out-gas system. Okay. At uh, 1,300 to 1,500, you use the usual in, in the gallium arsenide phosphide or indium phosphide. 670, you can use, this is red emitting aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide okay, on gallium arsenide. Notice this is a, okay, this is a, a three cations, one anion. And uh, longer wavelength, two to five microns, you can use uh, the gallium, indium, arsenide, and timonide system. This will probably lattice match on something like indium arsenide. Okay. So a variety of VC cells are available. Okay. Uh, notice that in some of these systems, the question of uh, lattice matching uh, occurs. Uh, we know that, for example, al gas uh, lattice matches with gas. Okay. But what about um, in gas? In gas does not lattice match. Okay. 
So another very important uh, materials uh, advance is what I'll introduce today is the advent of strained layers. Of strain layer epitaxy, which has introduced a new dimension into the engineering of these uh, materials. Uh, earlier, we used to always look at lattice mat systems. Okay, uh, you know, if you look at uh, energy versus lattice parameter, we know that uh, gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide okay, have almost the same lattice parameter. So this is a lattice match system. Then when we go um, to indium arsenide, okay, then we have uh, indium phosphide somewhere here. And in gas, that lattice matches to, to indium phosphide. Okay, so that is a lattice match system. In so there is certain constraint. Uh, obviously, in gas, as soon as you start introducing um, indium into gallium arsenide, you can grow the layer, but you know the lattice parameter shifts. Okay. Even with 0.2 indium, you know, lattice parameter is here. Now, um, so it is not a lattice match system. So until the 80s, it was thought that, okay, if you do not have uh, lattice matching, uh, you will get a lot of uh, dislocations and the layer will be uh, no good for any electronic application. You can get a polycrystalline layer, but it will not be of any particular use. Why do you want, uh, you know, uh, something like that? Because remember, um, when you are trying to form heterojunctions, okay. suppose we, the first and most common heterojunctions were gas, L gas, okay. this is say L gas. And this is the heterojunction band of so delta EC, which is much larger than delta EV. The larger it is, the better the current confinement, uh, the better the difference in uh, um, uh, optical properties also. Can you increase uh, this delta EC? Okay. One of the ways is if you go to in gas, okay, then this band gap is coming down. So in gas would have higher delta EC. Okay. Even if you put, could, can put in 0.2, oh, uh, the band offset would increase. So this is one uh, driving force for uh, trying to grow in gas on gallium arsenide. Uh, it has been shown now it is possible through uh, strain layer epitaxy. There are another a uh, number of other, uh, it gives you more freedom okay, um, to uh, choose uh, materials. And the other uh, big advantage is, as the name suggests, it's strained layer. So the effect of strain, strain effects has large effect on not only EG, but on the nature of the valence band. The degeneracy of the valence band is removed. Okay. Uh, suppose without strain you have a band structure something like this. This is the heavy hole band, this is the light hole band and then you have the split off band. Okay. This is the conduction band. Now we will see uh, the effect of tensile and compressive stress will be changed, will be to change this band structure. And if it changes the band structure, 
then non-radiative recombination, Auger recombination can be, can be reduced. So what, that is one big advantage of what is known as, uh, it's known as valence band engineering now. The constructive uses of strain in changing the band structure. Now, right at the beginning, it is the material science aspect that is important. And uh, can you grow strained layers? That is the question. Okay, if you can see this, and normally, when you have lattice-matched layers, okay, uh, the, you have the epilayer and the substrate having the same lattice parameter. Okay. If, they have, if you have different lattice parameters, then what happens? Uh, since this is uh, different, the lattice parameter, the epilayer is larger than or different from this, you have dislocations introduced, large number of edge dislocations. And so these act as recombination centers. They reduce uh, the carrier mobility as well as the um, carrier lifetime. So what happens then? This is the conventional uh, way. Suppose on the gallium arsenide, you grow indium phosphide. Okay? You have indium poly polycrystalline indium phosphide here, and you get single crystal gallium arsenide. In between, you have a large area of dislocations. This is unstrained then. Okay, it's called unstrained or relaxed. So indium phosphide will have its own lattice parameter, gallium arsenide will have its own lattice parameter. Okay. But it turns out that in the early 80s, people like Bean, etc., they showed that if the thickness of this epi layer is less than a critical thickness, say this is some, some H, okay, this is less than critical thickness, then what happens? This lattice elastically conforms to the lattice parameter here. Okay. So thin uh, epi layers can be strained without introducing dislocations. And so the lattice matching requirement can be relaxed such that uh, you can grow gallium arsenide on germanium or silicon. Um, and you can accommodate lattice mismatch of the order of 3 to 4 percent. Now, uh, the question is, what is this um, thickness of the critical layer? We have seen that um, what happens here, the in-plane lattice parameter, okay, here and here is the same. But what happens there, as I have so shown, out of plane, this is larger than this, okay, because the unit cell volume must be the same. So in the lattice parameter parallel to the planes are the same, but a perpendicular is larger okay, to accommodate the volume. Uh, let me just uh, end by trying to uh, give you a physical idea of what is this value of, of H, what is the critical layer thickness, and that is very important from the point of view of actual fabrication. It turns out that it's a question of minimum energy. Okay? Uh, in one case, if there is mismatch, you have dislocations forming. Okay. Um, I'll write down the expressions last time, uh, next time. But you can see that th there is what is this energy versus layer thickness. Okay. So uh, the energy for formation of dislocation is relatively independent of layer thickness. It depends if the layer is very thin, the energy is slightly less. But this is this can be called a constant. And what is the energy of the layer which is strained? That strained layer energy is linearly proportional to H, that is the thickness. Okay. So I'll look at the actual values uh, next time. Sigma 0, B is the Burgers vector H. Dislocation energy, you know, is GB squared by, you know, it depends upon the uh, elastic constants, Burgers vector, etc. And so, uh, just from the energy minimization point of view, as long as the critical layer thickness is below this red line here, okay, then it is energetically favorable for a strained layer to form. And when this critical uh, layer thickness exceeds this HC, then obviously dislocations will be energetically more favorable. Okay, so this HC. Uh, as I'll uh, derive uh, 
next time, but I'll, I will, uh, okay, maybe E strain is sigma 0 B into H and E dislocation is G B squared. This is conventional material science to 1 minus nu Poisson's ratio B is the Burgers vector log R1 over R0. R0 is the core of the dislocation, R1 is the strain region. And uh, the relation uh, you put E strain is equal to E dislocation. You put R1 is equal to H and R0 is equal to B, the Burgers vector. Okay? And you get the relation that HC, critical thickness, is B 4 pi. 1 minus nu, the Poisson ratio, epsilon 0, log hc by b. Okay. There is hc also here, so it has to be sort of iterative. And uh, it turns out that a simple relation, experimentally it is found, what is obvious that hc is inversely proportional to the strain, okay, the mismatch. And in fact, HC, the critical layer thickness, very approximately for many systems, it is just 100 by epsilon 0. Okay? That is the relative strain. So if epsilon 0 is, say, 0 0.1, okay, then HC is, uh, this is in uh, angstroms. Okay? It's 1,000 angstroms, okay? which is quite a large even if epsilon 0 is 1, HC is 100 angstroms. Okay? So nowadays, a lot of the quantum wells, etc., have thicknesses less than 100 angstroms. So you can grow a whole series of layers uh, which are strained, which are not, rela which are not relaxed. And uh, these uh, go under the name, you often hear this term, pseudomorphic, that morphology is the... Keep on the credit. Uh, so take it. Take it. Next time I'll So uh, this is pseudomorphic is uh, that these uh, epi layer is conforming okay, uh, to the same morphology as the substrate. Okay, fine. I'll work.